some words with a mummy by Edgar Allan Poe. Επιμέλεια Γιώργος Πιτροπογιανάκης. The symposium of the preceding evening had been a little too much for my nerves. I had a wretched headache and was desperately drowsy. Instead of going out, therefore, to spend the evening as I had proposed, it occurred to me that I could not do a wiser thing than just eat a mouthful of supper and go immediately to bed. A light supper, of course. I'm exceedingly fond of Welsh rabbit. More than a pound at once, however, may not at all times be advisable. Still, there can be no material objection to two. And really, between two and three, there is merely a single unit of difference, I ventured, perhaps, upon four. My wife will have it five, but clearly she has confounded two very distinct affairs. The abstract number five I am willing to admit, but concretely it has reference to bottles of brown stout, without which, in the way of condiment, Welsh rabbit is to be eschewed. Having thus concluded a frugal meal, and donned my nightcap, with the serene hope of enjoying it till noon the next day, I placed my head upon the pillow, and through the aid of a capital conscience, fell into a profound slumber forthwith. But when were the hopes of humanity fulfilled? I could not have completed my third snore when there came a furious ringing at the street door bell, and then an impatient thumping at the knocker, which awakened me at once. In a minute afterwards, and while I was still rubbing my eyes, my wife thrust in my face a note from my old friend Dr. Panona. It ran thus. Come to me by all means, my dear good friend, as soon as you receive this. Come and help us to rejoice. At last, by long preserving diplomacy, I have gained the assent of the directors of the city museum to my examination of the mummy. You know the one I mean. I have permission to unswathe it and open it, if desirable. A few friends only will be present. You, of course. The mummy is now at my house, and we shall begin to unroll it at eleven tonight. Yours ever, Ponona. By the time I had reached the Ponona, it struck me that I was as wide awake as a man need be. I leapt out of bed in an ecstasy, overthrowing all in my way, dressed myself with a rapidity truly marvellous, and set off at the top of my speed for the doctors. There I found a very eager company assembled. They had been awaiting me with much impatience. The mummy was extended upon the dining-table, and the moment I entered, its examination was commenced. It was one of a pair brought several years previously by Captain Arthur Sabretash, a cousin of Panona's, from a tomb near Elythias in the Libyan mountains, a considerable distance above Thebes on the Nile. The grottoes at this point although less magnificent than the Theban sepulchres, are of higher interest on account of affording more numerous illustrations of the private life of the Egyptians. The chamber from which our specimen was taken was said to be very rich in such illustrations, the walls being completely covered with fresco paintings and bas-reliefs, while statues Vases and mosaic work of rich patterns indicated the vast wealth of the deceased. 
The treasure had been deposited in the museum precisely in the same condition in which Captain Sabretash had found it. That is to say, the coffin had not been disturbed. For eight years it had thus stood, subject only externally to public inspection. We had now, therefore, the complete mummy at our disposal, and to those who are aware how very rarely the unransacked antique reaches our shores, it will be evident at once that we had great reason to congratulate ourselves upon our good fortune. Approaching the table, I saw on it a large box or case, nearly seven feet long, and perhaps three feet wide by two and a half feet deep. It was oblong, not coffin-shaped. The material was at first supposed to be the wood of the sycamore, but upon cutting into it we found it to be pasteboard, or, more properly, papier-mâché, composed of papyrus. It was thickly ornamented with paintings, representing funeral scenes and other mournful subjects, interspersed among which, in every variety of position, were certain series of hieroglyphical characters, intended, no doubt, for the name of the departed. By good luck, Mr. Glidden formed one of our party, and he had no difficulty in translating the letters, which were simply phonetic, and represented the word Alla Mistakeo. We had some difficulty in getting this case open without injury, but having at length accomplished the task, we came to a second, coffin shape, and very considerably less in size than the exterior one, but resembling it precisely in every other respect. The interval between the two was filled with resin, which had in some degree defaced the colours of the interior box. Upon opening this latter, which we did quite easily, we arrived at a third case, also coffin-shaped, and varying from the second one in no particular, except in that of its material, which was cedar, and still emitted the peculiar and highly aromatic odour of that wood. Between the second and third case there was no interval, the one fitting accurately within the other. Removing the third case, we discovered and took out the body itself. We had expected to find it, as usual, enveloped in frequent rolls or bandages of linen. But in place of these we found a sort of sheath made of papyrus, and coated with a layer of plaster, thickly gilt and painted. The paintings represented subjects connected with the various supposed duties of the soul, and its presentation to different divinities, with numerous identical human figures, intended, very probably, as portraits of the persons embalmed. Extending from head to foot, was a columnar, or perpendicular inscription, in phonetic hieroglyphics, giving again his name and titles, and the names and titles of his relations. Around the neck, thus ensheathed, was a collar of cylindrical glass beads, diverse in colour, and so arranged as to form images of deities, of the scarabaeus, and so on, with the winged globe. Around the small of the waist was a similar collar, or belt. Stripping off the papyrus, we found the flesh in excellent preservation, with no perceptible odour. The colour was reddish. The skin was hard, smooth, and glossy. The teeth and hair were in good condition. The eyes, it seemed, had been removed, and glass ones substituted, which were very beautiful and wonderfully lifelike. <laughs>
with the exception of somewhat too determined a stare. The fingers and the nails were brilliantly gilded. Mr. Glidden was of opinion from the redness of the epidermis that the embalmment had been effected altogether by asphaltum. But, on scraping the surface with a steel instrument, and throwing into the fire some of the powder thus obtained, the flavour of camphor and other sweet-scented gums became apparent. We searched the corpse very carefully for the usual openings through which the entrails are extracted, but to our surprise we could discover none. No member of the party was at that period aware that entire or unopened mummies are not unfrequently met. The brain it was customary to withdraw through the nose, the intestines through an incision in the side. The body was then shaved, washed, and salted, and then laid aside for several weeks when the operation of embalming, properly so called, began. As no trace of an opening could be found, Dr. Panona was preparing his instruments for dissection when I observed that it was then past two o'clock. Hereupon it was agreed to postpone the internal examination until the next evening, and we were about to separate for the present when someone suggested an experiment or two with the voltaic pile. The application of electricity to a mummy three or four thousand years old at the least was an idea if not very sage, still sufficiently original, and we all caught it at once. About one-tenth in earnest and nine-tenths in jest, we arranged a battery in the doctor's study and conveyed thither the Egyptian. It was only after much trouble that we succeeded in laying bare some portions of the temporal muscle which appeared of less stony rigidity than other parts of the frame, but which, as we had anticipated, of course, gave no indication of galvanic susceptibility when brought into contact with the wire. This, the first trial, indeed, seemed decisive, and with a hearty laugh at our own absurdity, we were bidding each other good-night, when my eyes— happening to fall upon those of the mummy, were there immediately riveted in amazement. My brief glance, in fact, had sufficed to assure me that the orbs which we had all supposed to be glass, and which were originally noticeable for a certain wild stare, were now so far covered by the lids that only a small portion of the tunica albuginea remained visible. With a shout I called attention to the fact, and it became immediately obvious to all. I cannot say that I was alarmed at the phenomenon, because alarmed is, in my case, not exactly the word. It is possible, however, that— but for the brown stout I might have been a little nervous. As for the rest of the company, they really made no attempt at concealing the downright fright which possessed them. Dr. Panona was a man to be pitied. Mr. Glidden, by some peculiar process, rendered himself invisible. Mr. Silk Buckingham, I fancy— will scarcely be so bold as to deny that he made his way upon all fours under the table. After the first shock of astonishment, however, we resolved, as a matter of course, upon further experiment forthwith. Our operations were now directed against the great toe of the right foot. We made an incision over the outside of the exterior, and thus got at the root of the muscle. Readjusting the battery, we now applied the fluid to the bisected nerves, when, 
with a movement of exceeding lifelikeness. The mummy first drew up its right knee, so as to bring it nearly in contact with the abdomen, and then, straightening the limb with inconceivable force, bestowed a kick upon Dr. Panona, which had the effect of discharging that gentleman like an arrow from a catapult through a window into the street below. We rushed out en masse to bring in the mangled remains of the victim, but had the happiness to meet him upon the staircase, coming up in an unaccountable hurry, brimful of the most ardent philosophy, and more than ever impressed with the necessity of prosecuting our experiments with vigour and with zeal. It was by his advice, accordingly, that we made, upon the spot, a profound incision into the tip of the subject's nose, while the doctor himself, laying violent hands upon it, pulled it into vehement contact with the wire. Morally and physically, figuratively and literally, was the effect electric. In the first place, the corpse opened its eyes and winked very rapidly for several minutes, as does Mr. Barnes in the pantomime. In the second place, it sneezed. And in the third, it sat up on end. In the fourth, it shook its fist in Dr. Panona's face. And in the fifth, turning to Monsieur Glidden and Buckingham, it addressed them thus. I must say, gentlemen, that I am as much surprised as I am mortified at your behaviour. Of Dr. Panona, nothing better was to be expected. He is a poor little fat fool who knows no better. I pity and forgive him. But you, Mr. Glidden, and you, Silk, who have travelled and resided in Egypt until one might imagine you to the manner born, you, I say, who have been so much among us that you speak Egyptian fully as well, I think, as you write your mother tongue, you— whom I have always been led to regard as the firm friend of the mummies, I really did anticipate more gentlemanly conduct from you. What am I to think of your standing quietly by and seeing me thus unhandsomely used? What am I to suppose by your permitting Tom, Dick, and Harry to strip me of my coffins, and my clothes in this wretchedly cold climate. In what light, to come to the point, am I to regard your aiding and abetting that miserable little villain, Dr. Panona, in pulling me by the nose? It will be taken for granted, no doubt, that upon hearing this speech under the circumstances— we all either made for the door, or fell into violent hysterics, or went off in a general swoon. One of these three things was, I say, to be expected. Indeed, each and all of these lines of conduct might have been very plausibly pursued. And upon my word, I am at a loss to know how or why it was that we pursued neither the one nor the other. But perhaps the true reason is to be sought in the spirit of the age, which proceeds by the rule of contraries altogether, and is now usually admitted as the solution of everything in the way of paradox and impossibility. Or perhaps, after all, it was only the mummy's exceedingly natural and matter-of-course air that divested his words of the terrible. However this may be, the facts are clear, and no member of our party betrayed any very particular 
trepidation, or seemed to consider that anything had gone very especially wrong. For my part, I was convinced it was all right, and merely stepped aside out of the range of the Egyptian's fist. Dr. Panona thrust his hands into his breeches' pockets, looked hard at the mummy, and grew excessively red in the face. Mr. Glidden stroked his whiskers and drew up the collar of his shirt. Mr. Buckingham hung down his head and put his right thumb into the left corner of his mouth. The Egyptian regarded him with a severe countenance for some minutes, and at length, with a sneer, said, "'Why don't you speak, Mr. Buckingham? "'Did you hear what I asked you or not? "'Oh, do take your thumb out of your mouth!' "'Mr. Buckingham hereupon gave a slight start, "'took his right thumb out of the left corner of his mouth, "'and, by way of indemnification, "'inserted his left thumb in the right corner "'of the aperture above mentioned.' Not being able to get an answer from Mr. Buckingham, the figure turned peevishly to Mr. Glidden, and in a peremptory tone demanded in general terms what we all meant. Mr. Glidden replied at length in phonetics, and but for the deficiency of printing offices in hieroglyphical type, it would afford me much pleasure to record here, in the original, the whole of his very excellent speech. I may as well take this occasion to remark that all the subsequent conversation in which the mummy took a part was carried on in primitive Egyptian, through the medium, so far as concerned myself and other untravelled members of the company, through the medium of Monsieur Glidden and Buckingham as interpreters. These gentlemen spoke the mother tongue of the mummy with inimitable fluency and grace, and I could not help observing that, owing no doubt to the introduction of images entirely modern, and of course entirely novel to the stranger, the two travellers were reduced occasionally to the employment of sensible forms for the purpose of conveying a particular meaning. Mr. Glidden, at one period, for example, could not make the Egyptian comprehend the term politics, until he sketched upon the wall with a bit of charcoal a little carbuncle-nosed gentleman out at elbows, standing upon a stump with his left leg drawn back, his right arm thrown forward, with his fist shut, the eyes rolled up towards heaven, and the mouth open at an angle of ninety degrees. Just in the same way, Mr. Buckingham failed to convey the absolutely modern idea Whig, until, at Dr. Panona's suggestion, he grew very pale in the face, and consented to take off his own. It will be readily understood that Mr. Glidden's discourse turned chiefly upon the vast benefits accruing to science from the unrolling and disembowelling of mummies, apologising upon this score for any disturbance that might have been occasioned him in particular, the individual mummy called Alla Mistakio, and concluding with a mere hint, for it could be scarcely considered more, that as these little matters were now explained, it might be as well to proceed with the investigation intended. Here Dr. Panona made ready his instruments. In regard to the latter suggestions of the orator, it appears that Alamistachio had certain scruples of conscience, the nature of which I did not distinctly learn, but he expressed himself satisfied with the apologies tendered and getting down from the table, shook hands with the company all around. When this ceremony was at an end, 
we immediately busied ourselves in repairing the damages which our subject had sustained from the scalpel. We sewed up the wound in his temple, bandaged his foot, and applied a square inch of black plaster to the tip of his nose. It was now observed that the Count, this was the title, it seems, of Alamestacchio, had a slight fit of shivering, no doubt from the cold. The doctor immediately repaired to his wardrobe, and soon returned with a black dress coat, made in Jennings' best manner, a pair of sky-blue plaid pantaloons with straps, a pink gingham chemise, a flapped vest of brocade, a white sack overcoat, a walking cane with a hook, a hat with no brim, patent leather boots, straw-coloured kid gloves, an eyeglass, a pair of whiskers, and a waterfall cravat. Owing to the disparity of size between the Count and the Doctor, the proportion being as two to one, there was some little difficulty in adjusting these habiliments upon the person of the Egyptian. But when all was arranged, he might have been said to be dressed. Mr. Glidden, therefore, gave him his arm, and led him to a comfortable chair by the fire, while the doctor rang the bell upon the spot, and ordered a supply of cigars. The conversation soon grew animated. Much curiosity was, of course, expressed in regard to the somewhat remarkable fact of Alamistakio's still remaining alive. "'I should have thought,' observed Mr. Buckingham, "'that it is high time you were dead.' "'Why?' replied the Count, very much astonished. I am little more than seven hundred years old. My father lived a thousand, and was by no means in his dotage when he died. Here ensued a brisk series of questions and computations, by means of which it became evident that the antiquity of the mummy had been grossly misjudged. It had been five thousand and fifty years, and some months, since he had been consigned to the catacombs at Elifias. "'But my remark,' resumed Mr. Buckingham, "'had no reference to your age at the period of interment. I am willing to grant, in fact, that you are still a young man.' and my allusion was to the immensity of time during which, by your own showing, you must have been done up in asphaltum. "'In what?' said the Count. "'In asphaltum,' persisted Mr. Buckingham. "'Ah, yes, I have some faint notion of what you mean. It might be made to answer, no doubt.' But in my time we employed scarcely anything else than the bichloride of mercury. But what are we specially at a loss to understand, said Dr. Panona, is how it happens that having been dead and buried in Egypt five thousand years ago, you are here today all alive and looking so delightfully well. Had I been, as you say, dead, replied the Count, it is more than probable that dead I should still be, for I perceive you are yet in the infancy of galvanism, and cannot accomplish with it what was a common thing among us in the old days. But the fact is, I fell into catalepsy, and it was considered by my best friends that I was either dead or should be. They accordingly embalmed me at once. I presume you are aware of the chief principle of the embalming process? Oh, why, not altogether. Ah, I perceive a deplorable condition of ignorance. Well, 
I cannot enter into details just now, but it is necessary to explain that to embalm, properly speaking, in Egypt, was to arrest indefinitely all the animal functions subjected to the process. I use the word animal in its widest sense, as including the physical not more than the moral and vital being. I repeat that the leading principle of embalmment consisted with us in the immediately arresting and holding in perpetual abeyance all the animal functions subjected to the process. To be brief, in whatever condition the individual was at the period of embalmment, in that condition he remained. Now, as it is my good fortune to be of the blood of the Scarabius, I was embalmed alive, as you see me at present. The blood of the Scarabius? exclaimed Dr. Panona. Yes, the Scarabius was the insignium, or the arms, of a very distinguished and very rare patrician family. To be of the blood of the Scarabius is merely to be one of that family of which the Scarabius is the insignium. I speak figuratively. But what has this to do with your being alive? Well, it's the general custom in Egypt to deprive a corpse before embalmment of its bowels and brains. The race of the Scarabii alone did not coincide with the custom. Had I not been a Scarabius, therefore, I should have been without bowels and brains, and without either it is inconvenient to live." "'I perceive that,' said Mr. Buckingham. "'And I presume that all the entire mummies that come to hand "'are of the race of the Scarabii, beyond doubt.' "'I thought,' said Mr. Glidden very meekly, "'that the Scarabius was one of the Egyptian gods.' "'One of the Egyptian what?' exclaimed the mummy, starting to his feet. Uh, "'Gods!' repeated the traveller. "'Mr. Glidden, I really am astonished to hear you talk in this style,' said the Count, resuming his seat. "'No nation upon the face of the earth has ever acknowledged more than one god. "'The Scarabius, the Ibis, and so on,' Were with us, as similar creatures have been with others, the symbols or media through which we offered worship to the Creator too august to be more directly approached. There was here a pause. At length the colloquy was renewed by Dr. Panona. It is not improbable, then, that from what you have explained, said he, that among the catacombs near the Nile there may exist other mummies of the Scarabius tribe in a condition of vitality? There can be no question of it, replied the Count. All the Scarabii embalmed accidentally while alive are alive. Even some of those purposely so embalmed, may have been overlooked by their executors, and still remain in the tombs. "'Will you be kind enough to explain,' I said, "'what you mean by purposely so embalmed?' "'With great pleasure,' answered the mummy, after surveying me leisurely through his eyeglass for it was the first time I had ventured to address him a direct question. "'With great pleasure,' he said. "'The usual duration of a man's life in my time was about eight hundred years.' 
Few men died, unless by most extraordinary accident, before the age of six hundred. Few lived longer than a decade of centuries, but eight were considered the natural term. After the discovery of the embalming principle, as I have already described it to you, it occurred to our philosophers that a laudable curiosity might be gratified, and at the same time the interests of science much advanced, by living this natural term in instalments. In the case of history, indeed, experience demonstrated that something of this kind was indispensable. An historian, for example, having attained the age of five hundred, would write a book with great labour, and then get himself carefully embalmed, leaving instructions to his executors, pro tem, that they should cause him to be revivified after the lapse of a certain period, say, five or six hundred years. Resuming existence at the expiration of this time, he would invariably find his great work converted into a species of haphazard notebook, that is to say, into a kind of literary arena for the conflicting guesses, riddles, and personal squabbles of whole herds of exasperated commentators. These guesses, and so on, which passed under the name of annotations or emendations, were found so completely to have enveloped, distorted, and overwhelmed the text, that the author had to go about with a lantern to discover his own book. When discovered, it was never worth the trouble of the search. After rewriting it throughout, it was regarded as the bounden duty of the historian to set himself to work immediately in correcting, from his own private knowledge and experience, the traditions of the day concerning the epoch at which he had originally lived. Now this process of rescription and personal rectification, pursued by various individual sages, from time to time had the effect of preventing our history from degenerating into absolute fable. "'I beg your pardon,' said Dr. Panona at this point, laying his hand gently upon the arm of the Egyptian. "'I beg your pardon, sir, but may I presume to interrupt you for one moment?' "'By all means, sir.' Uh, "'replied the Count, drawing up. "'I merely wish to ask you a question,' said the doctor. "'You mentioned the historian's personal correction of traditions "'respecting his own epoch. "'Pray, sir, upon an average, "'what proportion of these cabala were usually found to be right?' The Kabbalah, as you properly term them, sir, were generally discovered to be precisely on a par with the facts recorded in the unrewritten histories themselves. That is to say, not one individual iota of either was ever known, under any circumstances, to be not totally and radically wrong." "'But since it is quite clear,' resumed the doctor, "'that at least five thousand years have elapsed since your entombment, "'I take it for granted that your histories at that period, "'if not your traditions, were sufficiently explicit "'on that one topic of universal interest, the creation,' which took place, as I presume you are aware, only about ten centuries before. So, said the Count Alamistakio. The doctor repeated his remarks. 
but it was only after much additional explanation that the Egyptian could be made to comprehend them. The latter at length said, hesitatingly, "'The ideas you have suggested are to me, I confess, utterly novel. During my time I never knew anyone to entertain so singular a fancy as that the universe, or this world, if you will have it so, ever had a beginning at all. I remember once, and once only, hearing something remotely hinted by a man of many speculations concerning the origin of the human race, and by this individual the very word Adam, or Red Earth, which you make use of, was employed. He employed it, however, in a generical sense, with reference to the spontaneous germination from rank soil, just as a thousand of the lower genera of creatures are germinated. The spontaneous germination, I say, of five vast hordes of men, simultaneously upspringing in five distinct and nearly equal divisions. Here, in general, the company shrugged their shoulders, and one or two of us touched our foreheads with a very significant air. Mr. Silk Buckingham, first glancing slightly at the occiput and then at the sinciput of Alamestacchio, spoke as follows. Well, the long duration of human life in your time, together with the occasional practice of passing it, as you have explained in installments, I must have had, indeed, a strong tendency to the general development and conglomeration of knowledge. I presume, therefore, that we are to attribute the marked inferiority of the old Egyptians in all particulars of science, when compared with the moderns, and more especially with the Yankees, altogether to the superior solidity of the Egyptian skull. "'I confess again,' replied the Count, with much suavity, "'that I am somewhat at a loss to comprehend you. Pray, to what particulars of science do you allude?' Here our whole party, joining voices, detailed at great length the assumptions of phrenology and the marvels of animal magnetism. Having heard us to an end, the Count proceeded to relate a few anecdotes, which rendered it evident that the prototypes of Gaul and Spurzheim had flourished and faded in Egypt so long ago as to have been nearly forgotten, and that the manoeuvres of Mesma were really very contemptible tricks when put in collation with the positive miracles of the Theban savants, who created lice, and a great many other similar things. I here asked the Count if his people were able to calculate eclipses. He smiled rather contemptuously, and said they were. This put me a little out, and I began to make other inquiries in regard to his astronomical knowledge, when a member of the company, who had never as yet opened his mouth, whispered in my ear that for information on this head I had better consult Ptolemy, whoever Ptolemy is, as well as one Plutarch, de Fatsie Lunae. I then questioned the mummy about burning glasses and lenses, and in general about the manufacture of glass. But I had not made an end of my queries before the silent member again touched me quietly on the elbow and begged me, for God's sake, to take a peep at Diodorus Siculus. As for the Count, he merely asked me, in the way of reply, if we moderns possessed any such microscopes as would enable us to cut 
cameos in the style of the Egyptians. While I was thinking how I should answer this question, little Dr. Panona committed himself in a very extraordinary way. "'Look at our architecture!' he exclaimed, greatly to the indignation of both the travellers, who pinched him black and blue to no purpose. "'Look!' he cried with enthusiasm. "'Look at the bowling green fountain in New York! Or, if this be too vast a contemplation, regard for a moment the capital at Washington, D.C.' And the good little medical man went on to detail, very minutely, the proportions of the fabric to which he referred. He explained that the portico alone was adorned with no less than four and twenty columns, five feet in diameter, and ten feet apart. The Count said that he regretted not being able to remember, just at that moment, the precise dimensions of any one of the principal buildings of the city of Asnak, whose foundations were laid in the night of time, but the ruins of which were still standing, at the epoch of his entombment, in a vast plain of sand to the westward of Thebes. He recollected, however, talking of porticos, that one affixed to an inferior palace in a kind of suburb called Karnak, consisted of a hundred and forty-four columns, thirty-seven feet each in circumference, and twenty-five feet apart. The approach of this portico from the Nile was through an avenue two miles long, composed of sphinxes, statues, and obelisks, twenty, sixty, and a hundred feet in height. The palace itself, as well as he could remember, was, in one direction, two miles long, and might have been, altogether, about seven in circuit. Its walls were richly painted all over, within and without, with hieroglyphics. He would not pretend to assert that even fifty or sixty of the doctor's capitals might have been built within these walls, but he was by no means sure that two or three hundred of them might not have been squeezed in with some trouble. That palace at Karnak was an insignificant little building, after all. He, the Count, however, could not conscientiously refuse to admit the ingenuity, magnificence, and superiority of the fountain at the Bowling Green, as described by the doctor. Nothing like it, he was forced to allow, had ever been seen in Egypt or elsewhere. I here asked the Count what he had to say to our railroads. Nothing, he replied, in particular. They were rather slight, rather ill-conceived and clumsily put together. They could not be compared, of course, with the vast, level, direct, iron-grooved causeways upon which the Egyptians conveyed entire temples and solid obelisks of a hundred and fifty feet in altitude. I spoke of our gigantic mechanical forces. He agreed that we knew something in that way, but inquired how I should have gone to work in getting up the imposts on the lintels of even the little palace at Karnak. This question I concluded not to hear and demanded if he had any idea of artesian wells. But he simply raised his eyebrows, while Mr. Glidden winked at me very hard, and said in a low tone that one had been recently discovered by the engineers employed to bore water in the great oasis. I then mentioned our steel, but the Egyptian elevated his nose, and asked me if our steel could have executed the sharp, carved work seen on the obelisks, and which was wrought altogether by edge-tools of copper. This 
disconcerted us so greatly that we thought it advisable to vary the attack to metaphysics. We sent for a copy of a book called The Dial, and read out of it a chapter or two about something which is not very clear, but which the Bostonians call the Great Movement or Progress. The Count merely said that great movements were awfully common things in his day, and as for progress, it was at one time quite a nuisance, but it never progressed. We then spoke of the great beauty and importance of democracy, and were at much trouble in impressing the Count with a due sense of the advantages we enjoyed in living where there was suffrage ad libitum and no king. He listened with marked interest, and in fact seemed not a little amused. When we had done, he said that a great while ago there had occurred something of a very similar sort. Thirteen Egyptian provinces determined all at once to be free, and so set a magnificent example to the rest of mankind. They assembled their wise men, and concocted the most ingenious constitution it is possible to conceive. For a while they managed remarkably well, only their habit of bragging was prodigious. The thing ended, however, in the consolidation of the thirteen states, with some fifteen or twenty others, in the most odious and insupportable despotism that ever was heard of upon the face of the earth. I asked what was the name of the usurping tyrant. As well as the Count could recollect, it was Mob. Not knowing what to say to this, I raised my voice and deplored the Egyptian ignorance of steam. The Count looked at me with much astonishment, but made no answer. The silent gentleman, however, gave me a violent nudge in the ribs with his elbows, told me I had sufficiently exposed myself for once, and demanded if I was really such a fool as not to know that the modern steam-engine is derived from the invention of Hero, through Solomon de Caus. We were now in imminent danger of being discomfited. But as good luck would have it, Dr. Ponona, having rallied, returned to our rescue, and inquired if the people of Egypt would seriously pretend to rival the moderns in the all-important particulars of dress. The Count, at this, glanced downwards to the straps of his pantaloons, and then, taking hold of the end of one of his coat-tails, held it up close to his eyes for some minutes. Letting it fall, at last, his mouth extended itself very gradually from ear to ear. But I do not remember that he said anything in the way of reply. Hereupon we recovered our spirits, and the doctor— approaching the mummy with great dignity, desired it to say candidly, upon its honour as a gentleman, if the Egyptians had comprehended at any period the manufacture of either Pannona's lozenges or Brandreth's pills. We looked with profound anxiety for an answer, but in vain. It was not forthcoming. The Egyptian blushed and hung down his head. Never was triumph more consummate. Never was defeat born with so ill a grace. Indeed, I could not endure the spectacle of the poor mummy's mortification. I reached my hat, bowed to him stiffly, and took leave. Upon getting home, I found it past four o'clock, and immediately went to bed. <laughs>
It is now ten a.m. I have been up since seven, penning these memoranda for the benefit of my family and of mankind. The former I shall behold no more. My wife is a shrew. The truth is, I am heartily sick of this life, and of the nineteenth century in general. I am convinced that everything is going wrong. Besides, I am anxious to know who will be president in twenty forty five. As soon, therefore, as I shave and swallow a cup of coffee, I shall just step over to Panona's and get embalmed for a couple of hundred years. Epimelia, Yorgos Pitropoyanakis.